Hey everybody, what's going on? This is uh, Steve Gill, um, back with you for another episode of Loving the Scriptures. Um, glad that you're back with us. Um, and we're just going to get right into it. We've been, in case you're just joining us, if you're just discovering this podcast, um, this is a podcast where uh, we are, um, where we study scripture together, where we explore what God's word has word has to say to us and how um, how it can be applied to our everyday lives. Um, and over the past several weeks, we've, we've been going through the book of Acts. And um, I can't speak for any of you who are listening or have listened um, consistently, but I can say just for myself, this has been a um, a very profitable and worthwhile process going through um, the Book of Acts. And actually, now um, it's been it's it's been several weeks of me not on this podcast, but altogether just going through intentionally uh, going through the Book of Acts. Because as I mentioned before, uh, one of the reasons why I started doing this is just kind of an a, um, an increased interest in it. As I uh, preach through uh, some passages and Acts um, for a series of weeks. Um, and and uh, just wishing that I had a chance to teach through the whole book, um, and I do now, you know, because I because I have this podcast. So, um, so yeah. I, again, like I said, I hope this is something that is that is profitable um, to you. I hope you're getting a lot out of it. I hope that the Lord is showing you um, some very valuable things um, through this process as we go through um, as we go through the Book of Acts. We are getting ready to uh, pick up in uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, verse 42 and we're going to finish up Acts chapter 2 and um, we've uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, last time we we spent we spent two hours together. Um, if you were with me, you know that uh, that we spent a lot of time um, going through the second part of that Pentecost sermon. Um, and uh, even though that was a longer extended um, episode of Loving the Scriptures, I hope that uh, um, every every moment of that was worthwhile so that you could really see just the powerful impact and the powerful punch that uh, that what that that sermon served. And again, that was all through the work of the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter. Um, we looked at um, one of the reasons why those Jews were um, of such a panicked mind when they said, brothers, what shall we do? And then just looking at the message of grace that, that extends from that. So we're dealing with these, these Jews, many of them Hellenistic Jews, um, who were uh, um, faced with the, with the reality that uh, the only thing that they deserved from the hand of God was judgment because many of them had turned against their Messiah. They had, in most most likely, uh, been at, been screaming for his blood fifty days before uh, during the time of the Passover um, when Jesus was was going to be crucified. Um, and so now that they learned that that Jesus is alive and that he is reigning right now from heaven, they expect, oh no you know, the only thing that's left for us then from his hand is judgment. And so that's when Peter says, um, the one thing that you, that you can do is repent and be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we went through all of that. So there was the preaching of the gospel, there was baptism. And there at the very end, um, we see that there were, that there were 3000 souls added to their number that day. So we had, um, you know, from the beginning in Acts, when we look, when we were looking back in chapter one, we saw that there were the apostles, there were the women, there was Mary, um, there was Jesus's brothers, and then there was 120. So take that number of people and then add 3,000 to that, and that's what you had as far as the church that existed in Jerusalem. Now, here's the thing: uh, what we're going to see here, uh, and what you have to understand is that uh, think of it like this: if you're at you're in living in the town wherever you wherever you're from and you're talking to somebody from out of town let's say they're they're from across the country and they're there for whatever reason tourism they're visiting relatives or whatever and you just have this chance encounter with them um and you get to share the gospel with them and uh and they come to know the lord uh, i'm sure that the one thing that you're going to tell them is that when you go back to your hometown wherever you're from be sure to to find a healthy, well balanced church. Uh, tell the leadership that you that you're a new believer that in and, and, and everything and that sort of thing. The the main point being, be sure that you find a fellowship of Christians back at home where you came from. 
Um, that's just kind of the natural thing that we would that we would tell them to do. In our day and age, we would probably t- we could probably tell them that and still keep in touch with them. I mean, this is uh, you know this is 2017. Um, where all sorts of communicative technology is available for us where we can actually keep in contact with that person as well as they're getting plugged into a community wherever they're from. Um, so there's an extra advantage here in the, in the 21st century. But you have to understand, at this point now, the only church that exists is the church in Jerusalem. So there is no such thing as go back to your uh, go back to the place where you came from, whether it's Pontus, Bithynia, whether it's Egypt, whether it's, it's go back there um, and and find a healthy, well balanced church because they didn't exist there. They, they everything that happened started in Jerusalem. Now, also consider the fact that you're not just talking about one convert or two; you're talking about, as it says here, three thousand. Uh, just imagine if you, if even even with an uh, with an already established church in the 21st century, if all of a sudden through some evangelistic campaign you have 3,000 uh, people and they all want to come to your uh, church now, uh, 3,000 converts and they all want to attend your church. That's uh, um, that's pretty. That's a pretty significant thing, and it's going to be a little bit of a strain on your resources just from that big boom um, of of, of um, explosion of conversions. And I mention that because that's going to be something that uh, that the church is in Jerusalem is going to have to deal with, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this in this passage that we're going to talk about now. But it, it's um, it's going to be um, become important again down the road um, as we continue to look at the Book of Acts. Uh, so what you have here, where we left off in verse forty one, we saw that there were three thousand people that were added to um, added to the uh, added to their number. So again, uh, with the church in Jerusalem being the uh, literally the only church in existence in the entire world. These are people who aren't going to go home. They're going to stay where the where the church exists, and it's going to be important for them to do that. As we see what's going to be going on here in this in this passage, but as you can imagine, you have these pilgrims, many of whom had many of these Jews who were pilgrims who had come from other places um, in the Roman world into Jerusalem. They originally were here uh, were were in Jerusalem to uh, celebrate Pentecost. Um, and so after Pentecost is over, you're still going to have these people who are going to stick around. So there's still a big swell of a population of people in Jerusalem um, because of the gospel and because of conversions of people to Christ. And so because of that, you're going to have a little bit of a strain on, on resources and there's going to be needs that, that have to be met. You know, some people during this time voluntarily opened their homes to these pilgrims because they had you know if the inns were full they had nowhere else to stay um but you have to understand possibly the potential ramifications of what happens with some of these people who came to know the lord um some of them may have experienced persecution in the form of being kicked out of those places that's one thing that we have to understand one thing that we're going to see as we go through acts um, especially in these first several chapters, is that when we look at persecution, uh, initially all of it's really going to come from the hands of unbelieving Jews. Um, and what we have to understand about unbelieving Jews during that time and their view of of Christianity, um, and this will give us a little bit of an understanding of where of where Saul was coming from, um, is that they looked at this this new religious form that was taking captive all these all these quote unquote good Jews what these what regular Jewish society at large were seeing they were seeing the spread of of, of a heresy the way as they would as they called it um, you know while we understand that it was good this is all this is all uh, approved by Christ this is all this is all according to Christ's plan from the unbelieving Jews mindset those who still didn't believe this was a very dangerous sect and a very dangerous heresy uh, whose teachings were starting to spread through Jerusalem and it was going to spread even outwardly. So um, the persecution that was that was experienced by those who believed in Christ, again, came from the hands of Jews and probably what you had most likely were, were Jews who were thinking this is something that's dangerous that needs to be um, squashed down. Now, the squashing down of Christianity it, is it necessarily seen initially at this point, but I think that there is a possibility. We could speculate that one form of persecution that that people might have experienced, um, and I say might have because it's not 
necessarily um, spelled out in the text, uh, but something that might have happened was that people who were staying in homes, uh, in, in homes where people had opened up their homes, are now kicked out because of their new profession in Christ, which would contribute to the the whole thing of people being in need, um, you know, people having, you know, understand, because understand, even with people who are in, in Jerusalem as pilgrims, they have work to do back home, but if they're not going back, they have no source of income. So how are they going to eat? How, you know, how are all these needs going to be met? And so that's something that is, that you'll see come through in this passage and also later on. Um, that's not the central thing that we're going to focus on, though. It is part of the thing that we're going to see as we unfold this passage uh, that we're going to look at as we finish up chapter 2, which is in, which is in um, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 um, through 47. And this is a somewhat of a well-known passage. I know that some people like to preach on this passage as it relates to uh, taking a look at what a true Christian community uh, looks like. Now, having said that, let me remind you that in the book of Acts, uh, a lot of what we deal with in the book of Acts are not prescriptive things, they're descriptive, but those descriptive things hold very important principles that we can apply uh, to our individual lives and the corporate life of the church today. Um, so, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, um, as we as we go along um, as well. Uh, but I think that in a lot of ways, this passage, these, these concluding verses, verses um, in Acts chapter 2 um, are very attractive to a lot of people, both for church leaders and lay people alike. Um, I, for people who are really seeking out true, authentic community, they read passages like Acts 2, um, 42 through 47, and they say, ah, this really should be, is what the church should be all about. And, um, you know, and some people try and model um, their small groups uh, from the, uh, from this sort of fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's, that's okay. Um, some people, I think, may take it too far. And again, they, they treat everything in that passage um, in a way that says you have to do everything exactly the way that that they did it in Acts. So, um, for example, in uh, um, in verse 46, when it's talking about they, you know, breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. And you might think of them taking food with glad and generous hearts, you get the idea that these were people who shared a meal together, they ate together, and they fellowshiped over over common meals and things like that, which is probably true. And so to take this on a on a you know, kind of an extreme case, and I don't even I don't even think extreme is is the most accurate word. But I mean, if we're looking at an example of how this might look like if somebody is treating this passage as purely uh, prescriptive, they might say, well, in order for the church to grow, we have to we have to have meals together um, in order to grow and be a true New Testament church. Now, that's not necessarily the case. That's just how in their culture they, they really shared time together. Now, having said that, though, I think that there is something to be said about sharing meals together. It's a, um, and a lot of a lot of you who are you may go to churches where every week you share a meal, whether it's on Sunday afternoon after church, maybe it's in the middle of the week on a Wednesday or something like that, um, where you really share a lot of uh, intimacy with um, with your brothers and sisters in Christ just as far as uh, spiritual fellowship over a meal. Um, and um, that really contributes to the closeness that you have um, and just sharing your lives together. Um, and that's and that's totally cool. Um, you know, and, and so it, eating meals together could be a suggestion of something that we can encourage to do just as uh, we come together over a common meal and, and, and share our lives together. Um, I don't think this passage is necessarily saying um, one of the things you have to do in order to be a true, authentic New Testament church is to um, is to you know uh, is that you have to eat together. So you know that's that's not that's not really what it's saying there. But I think that uh, I think it does still speak something to us today, and and we should pay um, special attention. Um, special attention to that. So, um, so what? So we're going to see how this fellowship just kind of operates after this tremendous event at Pentecost, where you have these, uh, where you have these different uh, people, 
um, uh, coming to the Lord, 3,000 specifically. So um, let me let's do this. Let me let me read the uh, let me read the passage. Um, it's, it's not a big passage, so I can just read the whole passage and then we can go back and, and unpack things um, as we see them. OK, but um, in verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so there's a lot there. And there's a lot, uh, especially just in that initial verse, in verse 42. I might be spending a little bit of time there. And then from there, just kind of going a little bit more rapid fire through the rest of the verses. But verse 42 um, has a lot of things that we can that we can pick up on. Okay, so... Excuse me, as I take a drink of water, I mean, throat is kind of dry. But um, uh, as you start there in, in verse 42, there's uh, there are three things that we see that um, that the that the early church devoted themselves to, and I want you to underline that word in your mind there. Um, that uh, that this is something that they devoted themselves to, and I I, I, I want you to underline that because. Um, because that's a that's an easy word that we as Christians in the church can overlook, and um, it's uh, it's it's it speaks a very important word just as far as 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 fellowship is concerned. How in in community, there's a certain sense of devotion to one another and to the things of the community um, that uh, of of which you. Um, that of what you commune with, the people that you commune with. And so what are these three things that the, that the other church devoted themselves to? Well, as that verse says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, uh, the, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and, and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. So I guess maybe four things. I, I, I kind of miscounted there. There's, there's, um, there's four things. And, um, and and each of them can have a little bit of a word that can be spoken about it in turn. Um, and again, keep in mind this is all under the, the 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 underlying thought of this is something that there was there was a there was a specific devotion to each one of these things. And I and I and I harp on that whole thing of devotion is because I think one of the things that is a problem in the 21st century American church is that there isn't. There is we lack a level of devotion um, to community and uh, to these other things. Um, a lot of times, the things of the church are just treated as you know. Well, if I feel like doing them, I'll do them. A lot of times, I might not feel like doing it, and so I'll pass on this, and I'll just kind of it's it's just kind of very a lackadaisical sort of approach to the church and the things of the church. They might attend every week, they might go to a Bible study and things like that, but um, you know, if if something is not to your liking, or somebody or a group stops meeting your needs, or something like that, you say, well. And I guess it's just time to move on. You go to another church or something like that. There's a very, and, and in a way, it's kind of a disturbing trend. It's, 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 there's a kind of a disturbing trend on, on, on those sorts of things and how um, the 21st century American Christian approaches things at the church. And we're going to see that when it comes to the early church, there was, a, there was a sense of devotion. They devoted themselves to these things. Okay, so what was it that they devoted themselves to? They devoted themselves, one, to the apostles' teaching. In another way, now brace yourself for this. I'm going to throw every, I'll throw this out to you. Uh, it's going to throw everybody for a loop, maybe. Perhaps, maybe not everybody, but some of you. <laughs> okay, um, that word teaching there, what's the, 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 there's another word for teaching that you can use, and it, it means the same thing even in the original language in the Greek that you can put in there as well. Um, I'm gonna give you five seconds to think it over and, 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 and I'm gonna see if, and see if you can under, if you know what word I'm thinking of here. 
of another word for teaching. Okay. It is, right, brace yourself, doctrine. Now I say doctrine and I say brace yourself because whenever the term doctrine is, is, is mentioned, I mean, people get the shakes, they break out in hives and they go, oh no, you know, we can't have doctrine, can't have doctrine. Sometimes you have people who uh, try and encourage their pastors not to speak on doctrine. Um, and, you know, they think that doctrine is for just the academics or doctrine divides. That's, that's, that's kind of a, a, a misleading sort of belief that people in the church today seem to have. Don't talk about doctrine because doctrine divides. Truth of the matter is um, pretty much most of, the, most of the things that can be labeled as doctrines in the Bible are things that true Christians actually believe in. Um, you know, most of the time, if there are disagreements on things like the doctrine of the Trinity or or the deity of Christ and those sorts of things, usually the people who disagree with those people are they might ha hold some form of liberal theology or they're not even believers to begin with. Um, so let's not let's not uh, let's not downgrade doctrine as something that we should that we should avoid. Um, and in fact, what we have here with uh, with these with the early churches that they devoted themselves to doctrine. Now, some of your translations, depending on what translation you have and what you usually read from, might actually have that word in the English. Might actually have the word doctrine. My, I'm reading from the ESV. It says teaching. Um, if it does say doctrine in, in other translations, I'm, I'm at a loss at, at the moment of what uh, which translations use that word. But it, it's okay that they use that word. They're, they, they're one in the same word. They mean the same thing. Um, so we get so a lot of people get into a tizzy about doctrine, but doctrine simply means teaching. So from somebody is teaching from scripture, they're teaching doctrine. Okay, and this is again, this is something that the that the early church devoted themselves to. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Um, so I, I would see that the apostles' teaching. Uh, consisted of a couple things. Number one, the, the actual teaching of Scripture itself and from Scripture um, at that time, obviously we're meaning the Old Testament because the New Testament at this point hadn't been written yet. Um, but number two, along with that is the teachings that Jesus himself had taught the apostles, which the apostles are now, are, are now teaching to these 3,000 uh, converts. And, and really, um, you could com actually combine those two because one of the things that Jesus did was, and what he was able to do, even in his ministry, was combine teach the teachings of uh, his teachings with things that matched up with the Old Testament. And so, um, you probably had that with the apostles as well. And remember, these are apostles who um, it says at the end of Luke that that Jesus opened their minds so that they can understand the scriptures. Um, so with that understanding of what scripture says and how it applies to the present day and how things are being fulfilled, uh, the apostles are able to teach uh, these uh, teach these people um, the things that they need to know. Um, so this that this part of the verse really has something to say about good solid listen to me and again don't freak out good solid doctrinal teaching don't don't shy away from doctrine you know usually and and here's a good way of 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 of, of making a dis, uh, a distinction between some things an example of a doctrine okay is the second coming of Christ the bible does teach about the second coming of Christ now um are there disagreements about how that comes about? Yes, um, you have your you have your pre mill uh, pre mill uh, you have your and within that you have your dispensationalists you have your historic pre mill uh, pre mill believers you have um, you have amillennialists you have post millennialists um, as far as time frames you have preterists you have future you know you have all these different things you know it, it, it might even make your head spin when you try and uh, investigate all of these now just because there's uh, it, there's disagreements in there doesn't necessarily mean that there, that you shouldn't teach on the doctrine itself of the second coming somebody people from all of those schools can have a common teaching about the second coming of Christ and that he's going to come that he is going to come sin is going to be is going to be fully and finally done away with that will be resurrected um, that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth and, and things like that the, the how the puzzle fits together um, 
surrounding that whole doctrine, people might have different ideas. And that and those discussions that tries to entangle those things, those are those are more theological discussions. It's not necessarily something where it's doctrinal and we say, well, that's well, amillennialism, that's doctrine. And we have to do away with that because doctrine divides. No, that's that that's the doctrine is the second coming of Christ. Untangling all the things of the all the isms and and things like that, um, you know, th- those are theological. And that you know, some people might say I'm nitpicking at words, and admittedly, maybe I am. Um, but I think that there is a distinction that needs to be made um, in that doctrine are th- are the actual teachings of Scripture, um, and a lot of times they're they're uh, they're things that most true Christians will 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 believe in. So the second coming of Christ, there's a, that, that's that's a doctrine. That's a teaching in scripture. The deity of Christ, that's a teaching that's taught in scripture, right? Um, the the church, ecclesiology, I mean that's that's a that's a present term, you know, ecclesiology. Um, but I mean just the structure of the church, that's that's even that's a doctrine. You 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 read you kind of get hints of that in the in books like Ephesians and First Timothy and things like that. So don't get don't get all all bogged down with with doctrine and or don't be afraid of doctrine. Doctrine just simply means teaching. And that's what the that's what the apostles were doing. The apostles were teaching. Now, here's the thing. That's this really says a lot because one of one fear of mine is that we we our culture might start to go away from um, good solid teaching and might start to spend most of its time doing other things and teaching kind of getting the back going to the back burner. Teaching, oh, and we'll say teaching slash preaching. Um, and you know, the, the, I think the scriptures speak very clearly, even in the pastoral epistles, particularly in First Timothy and Second Timothy, on the importance of preaching and teaching. Don't let's not let's not have be Christians where in our churches we we slowly start to give that up. Okay, that's a very essential um, part of community is having people in place that God has called uh, to fill that role to teach from scripture and really this uh, what we see here in acts chapter 2 is um in many ways a fulfillment of of what jesus has uh, told them to do as far as the great commission um uh, of making disciples um uh, of all nations and he said baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit we saw baptism taking place in the in the previous section that we looked at last time um and um and then, and then he said in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So there's the teaching element. And even with that in the Great Commission, the whole thing of teaching, uh, saying that teaching them to obey. So it's not even with that, it's not even saying teaching them doctrines that they, that they need to know. I'm sure that's part of it. Um, but this, when he says teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded them, it's them really laying out what Scripture says, the teachings of Scripture and the teachings of Christ, um, that would later on be recorded in in New Testament scripture, um, teaching those uh, teaching those things, and then also along with that teaching, teaching them to obey and telling them these are things that you need to obey. So it's 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 a matter of knowing what you need to know and then living in obedience to that. So that's a very important element as well. Okay, so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, secondly, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Okay, and uh, you know that's that's very important because again we're talking about community, and many of us may be may be familiar with this. Perhaps I'm I'm preaching to the choir here, um, and then again maybe I'm not. I don't know where all of you stand or, or what all of you think, um, but fellowship is vitally important. And the and the whole thing with fellowship, as I understand it from the original language, kind of has also this this idea of a partnership together as a community. So um, let's 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 consider a couple of things here real, real quickly. No, one, which I think is obvious, and I think maybe a lot of you will will, will deem as obvious as well, um, is that you cannot live the Christian life alone. Um, perhaps you've heard the saying, um, "There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian," and that's then that's very true. The Christian life was designed to be lived in community. Um, to to be able to to speak into one another's lives, to encourage one another, to love one another, to serve one another, to minister together, uh, and 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 those sorts of things. If we don't have fellowship with other believers, um, then we aren't really living in the way that that Scripture tells us that we should be living. Um, and 
we could we could go to several other places in Scripture um, that is. Uh, prescriptive in that way of talking about the importance of fellowship and and being together. Um, it, for example, it's he, Hebrews ten comes to mind. Do not give up the the assembling together of one another. Um, you know, the, you're to encourage one another um, in in doing that when you when you come together. So. This is all very important, and I think that that, that means the same thing um, on the on the corporate level and even on more smaller intimate scales, maybe if you're talking about a small group. So I don't think people are living biblically if they, for example, and we're not, and by the way, we're, I'm not talking about shut-ins here, people who aren't able to leave the house because of ailments or something like that. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about people who they don't, they don't plug themselves into a healthy, well-balanced church, and they just and their idea of quote unquote church is they just go to um, they just listen to somebody preach on the internet or something, or they go to the, they watch TV on the Christian station and uh, and they listen to several Bible teachers. Listen, that's not church. Now, all of those things have their place and they're valuable, but those things never are supposed to take the place of being involved in a church, spending time with believers. And again, I think that's both in the in the larger corporate sense and in the smaller, more intimate senses, whether you're talking about small group or one-on-one -on -one discipleship um, or anything, the fellowship of that, of that manner is very important. Now, here's another thing that we need to talk about as far as fellowship, okay? Because sometimes we might throw, we can throw that term fellowship around very loosely. Um, and sometimes we, here's the thing, we think of fellowship sometimes as, um, uh, you know, if, if you have a group of people who, who meet up at somebody's house and they have a barbecue or something, or, you know, the Super Bowl's on, and so you're, you have a group of Christians from your church who come, they, they come together and they watch the Super Bowl or, um, or, or something along those lines. It's a little get-together. Maybe there's a game night with a group from your church and you get together and you play cards or board games or something like that. And then, you know, people will say, man, we just had a good, we had good fellowship together today or something like that. And again, people might accuse me of being nitpicky here as far as words and terms are concerned, but really in the true sense of the term, those, those things aren't fellowship. I'm not saying they're bad, um, they're okay. I participate in things. It's okay for Christians to get together, and the only thing that they do is is play football or or get together and have a potluck dinner or watch the Super Bowl together or, or or something like that. But really, in the true sense of the term, that's not fellowship. We usually because what we usually think of as fellowship is a group of believers getting together and spending time together. Um, that's too broad, I think, of a, of, a, of a term. Again, if we're thinking about fellowship as sort of a partnership together, really I think the more accurate way of looking at true authentic fellowship is people coming together um, with a common intentional purpose of having Christ in the center of everything that they're, uh, that, uh, that they're doing at that moment, speaking into one, each one, is, uh, one another's lives, speaking about Christ, encouraging one another from Scripture, praying together, those sorts of things. All of those things are manifestations of the, of the partnership that is, that is true of every Christian um, now that they are one in Christ. Okay, so really, that's what that's what you have. So when it comes to fellowship, I think that's where a lot of the one another's come in, and I've already mentioned them. I think just in these last couple of minutes, you know, loving one another, sharing with one another, praying with one another, um, those those sorts of things. Um, again, I'm not saying that the other things that I mentioned before, barbecue, Super Bowl parties, and things like that, are bad or or wrong or anything like that. I'm just trying to cinch up a little bit more the the, the true definition of, 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 of fellowship. Um, so when we have fellowship in our minds and saying what's the biblical model of fellowship or what does this look like, I think places in the book of Acts um, when we talk about fellowship, that's kind of what they're talking about. They're talking about that commonality of coming together um, and sharing life together for the glory of God um, in Christ Jesus. So you have that there. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, the fellowship. Thirdly, to the breaking the breaking of bread, and 
most likely, most likely they're talking about um, the Lord's Supper. That's one way that that uh, that the Lord's Supper was is, was uh, was referred to as the breaking of bread. Admittedly, that that could also mean sharing a sharing a meal together. Um, that has nothing to do with the with the uh, um, with the Lord's Supper. Um, but I think um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this whole thing of breaking bread had to do with um, uh, had to do with uh, communion with the Lord's Supper. Um, that's another thing that uh, one of the ordinances that's instituted to the church. Um, one is baptism, and we've already seen that. Um, in the earlier passage, um, and perhaps we're seeing that now here, um, and and that's just something. Again, if we're talking about a community um, in in the Lord's Supper, I think it's very. Um, uh, I think that's a very cool thing, um, and I don't know. Cool is that might be an understatement, um, but when we when we share the Lord's Supper together. Um, and and celebrate together the body and the blood of Jesus Christ um, because it affects all of us and we all partake of the one loaf, right? Um, you know, we're all together. We are now one. We, we all have, have the same spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. You see that you hear those, those, those terms of unity um, in places like the book of Ephesians. Um, and, uh, you know, even when it came to the Lord's Supper back at that time, um, usually they partook of one and the same loaf. And I think that that um, really spoke volumes as well. Um, so, you know, I... And here's here's the thing. I'm I'm not going to make a huge deal out of this. Um, it's not necessary. This isn't something that I would by by any means. I would I would never really declare war on something like this. But um, as far as the 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 form that we take in communion in our churches today in the 21st century, I prefer it more when we have communion um, in where we all partake of the bread and the cup together. Instead of, instead of you know, and I've been to certain churches where where they where they do this the latter the latter thing where they um, where everybody gets you know a piece of bread and they get a cup and while the music is playing they take communion on their own and so they pray they you know they do whatever in their own heart and they and they and they take the bread and the cup and and the little cup of apple juice you know just when they're ready. So everybody's taking it whenever they're ready and, 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 and in their own time, which, again, I'm not going to declare war on that. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it, it speaks a little bit to the individuality that, that has permeated our churches today. Now, there's nothing. I mean, there are things that, need, that we need to pay attention to individually. I mean, there is the individual part of our, of our own personal relationship with Christ. But in, in a New Testament sense, even with things that we read in the New Testament, we don't often realize that a lot of things are, are spoken in a corporate sense. And so communion is, communion is one of those things that I think is, is something that we all celebrate corporately. I don't think it was really meant to um, be something where, okay, whenever you're ready and whenever you search your heart, whenever, you know, uh, you... You, whenever you're ready to take the bread and the cup, go ahead and take it. We turned something that I think was originally meant to be something taken in community, um, and we've and and again, I'm not saying every church does this. I mean, it's I I've, I've been to churches where they do, where you know one church does it one way, the other church does it the other way, and the in the places where it's kind of done individually, I think that in some way kind of misses the point of, 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 of things. It's not only just simply a, a celebration of the body and blood of Christ and as a remembrance, as a memorial of that, that's, it is what that is. But I think contextually of what we do with that, I think that's meant to be something that we do together. So that's why I say that I prefer, I, I prefer it where we have, where we have the, um, where where everybody takes the we has the elements and then together we say this is the you know the body of Christ do this in remembrance of me we take it and then the cup and we do the same thing we all do that together because I think that's more in line with what 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 what, what they had in mind back then um, communion and the and the and the Lord's Supper I think was meant originally to be more something that we celebrate together and not just something that we do on an individual basis so. Uh, that's all I really have to say about that. And the prayers is the last thing. So they devoted themselves to, to the prayers. 
and again, I've mentioned this before, and I'll just go ahead and bring this up again, um, that prayer is a very important element. You see this coming out in Acts. We've talked about it a little bit before. And even I believe, if I look back here, um, um, way back when we, when, we, when we were exploring um, chapter 1, um, let me see if I can, if I can find that verse. Um, yeah, in verse 14, and this is before Pentecost, and this was just with the apostles and the women and, and everybody else. In verse 14, it says, all these with one accord were, listen, there's a word, devoting themselves to prayer. Okay. So, uh, and, I, and I think I've mentioned before, and I think it was actually when we went over that verse a few weeks ago, um, where I was saying that one of the things that I think is that we really overlook in our churches is a, an intentional um, concentration on prayer, okay? And um, I'm not just talking about prayer in the sense of healing Aunt Agnes's knee, and I don't mean to say that in a, in a uh, belittling sort of way. I mean, we have concerns with other people and their health and things like that, and we can pray for that also. Um, but really, if you look at prayer and how we do it today, much of what we pray about has to do with healing from sickness, um, let, uh, help me find a job, help me find a mate, help me do the, I mean, these, those sorts of things. Um, but really we leave a lot of the kingdom, the things that have to do with kingdom agenda stuff by the wayside. So that really tells us how we approach prayer, whether it's individually or even as a group. I think that when you look at Acts, and we're gonna, and again, we're going to even see this again later on when we get into Acts chapter 4. One of the things you see about, about prayer is that when they prayed together as a group, they had a very strong, genuine concern about seeing the Lord's work advance in and through them and for his power to be displayed among the people that would win people to Christ. I mean, there was an intentional purpose, and it, was, and it, it, it had kingdom purposes in mind. That's, that's one thing that I want us to pick up on when it comes to this book, uh, it comes to the book of Acts. And we have to really examine our own hearts individually and maybe, and maybe even corporately when we look at the book of Acts and say, what are, what are some of the things that are modeled for us? Um, so, and again, I think this is something that I mentioned before, but I'll just present it again, where I say, I wonder, uh, you know, if we are, if we are foregoing seeing the power of God at work in our lives and in our church and in our communities, because we, we don't really give much attention to prayer corporately. Um, again, whenever it comes to coming together, it's really along the lines of, of studying the Bible and having Bible studies, which again, that's not wrong. That's not bad. I'm not saying don't do that, but um, prayer gets scant attention. And in fact, you, you really run into a lot of people that don't um, have a lot of a, a, a desire for, for prayer. Um, I, uh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I remember the author and the book title from where I got this from. This was a long time ago um, where I was reading a book um, where there, the, the author, he was a pastor, he, uh, he was, uh, was going to have a prayer meeting in his church one, one evening. And so he was, he was at the church building early and he was setting up chairs, you know, just kind of getting things ready for this prayer meeting that he was, that he was going to have uh, with whoever was interested in coming. And so there was one guy who came in, um, and uh, he was the first one to arrive. He was the only one there other than the pastor. And he said, uh, and he looked at the pastor, and he said, is this the place where we're going to have the, the seminar on prayer? And the pastor said, well, it, it, no, it's not a seminar. It's not a teaching or anything like that on prayer. It's an actual prayer meeting. We're going to be getting together, and we're going to be praying. And the guy goes, oh, and he turns around and he leaves. Um, but that demonstrated, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, now, this was several years ago. So the book was, and the story itself was, was, was old and several years old. But again, I, I, I don't think that that's too far off of how people treat prayer and how people look at prayer today. We, we very willingly hear a lot of sermons about prayer and how to pray and things like that. But when it comes to having a prayer meeting, hey, let's get together to pray. And uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden people turn busy or uh, they they don't want to come or and, and things like that. So I think that that served a, a good, as a good illustration of how we how we look at prayer um, in, in our in our American culture today. But this was something listen again very carefully. Keep in mind the word devotion. This was something that they devoted themselves to. 
they devoted themselves to prayer. And so, you know, and again, I don't I don't think that I that I could safely say that in our American culture, corporately as a church, we are we are churches that are that devote ourselves to prayer. In fact, even on an individual level, we, 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 many of us, and I will include myself from time to time, will say, man, I just, that's a discipline that I just have trouble keeping up with. I don't pray consistently. So even if on an individual level, if that's the case, a corporate level, I would imagine that that's, that that's even more of a remote thing that happens in the church. Okay. But as we see, as we've seen before in chapter one, as we see here in chapter two, and as we're going to see later, this whole theme of prayer going on, you know what you see? Big surprise, the Lord, it, you, they get to see the Lord in action. The Lord moves. Imagine that. The Lord moves when we pray. So that's why I say, I wonder if we if we short circuit ourselves and for foregoing seeing the work of the Lord in our midst because we don't devote ourselves to prayer. Um, and we have so many concerns about other things. Um, I think that that might actually be the case. So that's verse 40, uh, that's verse 42. Now let's go to verse 43. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Okay. So there was in that awe, the other word for awe is fear. And that's not a phobia sort of fear. Like I'm scared of something. Although I think I'd have to look at the Greek. I think the, 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 the root word from that is where we get the word phobia from in English. But, um, contextually, what we're talking about is a very strong sense of reverential awe. Um, and that awe, I would imagine, comes from seeing the Lord at work. And, and of course, that's not surprising if we're, see, if we're talking about a group of people who are devoted or have devoted themselves to prayer, among other things. But you, they see the Lord at work. And one of those things, one of those ways that they see the Lord at work, um, as that verse also says, is um, with, uh, with wonders, and, and wonders and signs. Now, wonders and signs and miracles and things like that, I mean, um, one thing we have to understand is that in this passage, it's saying that this happened through the apostles. Um, now, some people might say, well, in, in our day and age, that goes beyond the apostles. Other people can do that as well. And other people will say, no, that's, that's just specifically for the apostles. I'm one who kind of gravitates towards the latter part of that. Um, but don't let that trip you up because some people might hear me say that and they say, what, you, so you don't think God can work powerfully and, and miracles can't happen today? No, I didn't say that at all. Um, I think that there's a specific purpose as to why it happened through the apostles or people who are closely associated with them. Because again, we're going to see Philip and Stephen doing the same things later on in the book of Acts. But you have to understand that along with signs, wonders, and miracles was the preaching of the word and the preaching of the gospel. And one of the reasons why that was the case was because you didn't have um, a new written revelatory word about all of this. You didn't have the New Testament there. There was a there was a next step in the revelation of, 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 of biblical truth that was happening. Now that we have the written word, scripture, um, you have, you have, you, you, you know, you don't really need those things anymore. Um, although God can do that if he wants to. And again, like I said, I, I'm not I'm not saying that God doesn't work miracles or, or, or there aren't signs and wonders today. Just to give you just to give you an example. Um, I remember a long time ago, somebody that I knew telling me about how I think it was his dad. Um, his dad had um, had cancer. I mean, it was all over his body. They didn't know if they were pretty sure he wasn't going to be able to make it. But, you know, him and his family, they, they, they kept on praying for him. He went to the doctor one day and they did an examination on him and the cancer was gone. All of it. Not a, not a single trace of cancer in his body. Now, of course, the doctors are scratching their head and they're wondering how did, how did something like that happen? Um, but this guy and his family, I think his family were believers. I, I guess they, I was so, suppose they would be if they were praying consistently for this. Um, they they would see it and rightly so as a miracle from God. Yeah, that's that. There's no other way to explain it. God intervened and He took all the cancer out of that guy's body. That's a miracle. Just because just because I, I would say that uh, miraculous ministries like we have with the apostles aren't something that you would probably see today doesn't mean that uh, d that's not to say that I don't believe that miracles don't happen. They certainly do. Um, whether it happens through a person or not doesn't matter. If God shows up, God can show up any way that he wants to. Uh, 
Um, so again, I don't want to take away, I don't want people to understand me as saying that I don't think that, that those things don't happen today. They do. The way that it happens and the form that it does um, is different. And we also have to be very careful because, you know, some people will understand that that one of the reasons why you had signs and miracles in the New Testament was that it was used to authenticate what was being spoken by the apostles. Because again, what they're teaching is not only the things from the Old Testament, but they're teaching the things of Christ, which in many ways is very tied, tied to what the New Testament does speak on. Okay, so people I recognize that and it's true, but they take that and they make a wrong conclusion and they say, now that means that when we preach the gospel, People need to see signs and wonders and miracles so that it authenticates what we say. And usually, people who say that are from a, for, for, are from people who major heavily on on signs and wonders and miracles. That's they make that their life, and it really comes, at least from my perspective, comes from people who already have a questionable reputation to begin with. Um, I knew one. I know one guy, a public ministry uh, that he had, um, and it didn't matter what he was talking about. Sometimes he'd be talking about something from Scripture where you wouldn't even imagine um, the subject of signs, wonders, and miracles showing up, and then somehow he's able to tie it into signs, wonders, and miracles, and saying you can do these sorts of things. I'm like, how did you come to that conclusion? So, anyway, he was one of that guy. By the way, that I'm referring to is one of those people who was saying that. We need those things to authenticate the message so that people will come and believe. No, you do not. Uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of Christ. That's what Scripture says in the book of Romans. Um, you know, I my conversion experience didn't come by seeing a miracle. And I'm sure that there are thousands of people who will be able to say the same thing, that when they came to Christ, it wasn't because they heard a message and then saw a miracle. Now, can God do that? Can God combine the two still today? Sure. God can do what he wants in that area. Um, but the, this whole thing, if this is what we need uh, to have happen, is I don't, I don't buy that. Again, the manifestation of the Spirit's power, as we see in the book of Acts, doesn't mean that that's the way that it's going to always manifest itself in every age through every single person. Um, I, I think we misunderstand what we read in Scripture when we, when we approach things in that, in that manner. Um, so we have to be careful about that. But the the thing is, is that people were in awe and they were and they were it was very it was very um, um, it was very evident that the work of God was was going on um, in their midst. It was hard to miss. And it was in and it, and it brought about this sense of, uh, again, fear, but fear, not in the sense of I'm afraid, but it's it's a it's it's a reverence. It's a reverential fear. Um, that we're talking about there. So that's what that's what you had going on there. Um, verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now this is I'm going to connect this with with uh, the next uh, with the next verse here, verse 45. It says, and they were and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Okay. Now here we had to be careful because this. These these verses have been used to um, promote um, it in a in a in a pre in a prescriptive sort of way because again here here again we we have the whole thing of people who don't dis distinguish the prescriptive from the descriptive they say in a prescriptive way this is how the church should be living and so they 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 promote communal living where everybody pools their resources in and everybody shares um, all their possessions together and saying this is how the church is supposed to be I don't know if that's really something a a, a teaching that that's still popular today I know it has been been really uh, promoted in in years past um, whether that still has some uh, has staying power today and to what degree I'm not entirely sure but it wouldn't surprise me if people are still uh, singing that tune um, when it comes to this whole thing so uh, you know people are saying does this does this uh, promote communism and, and and things like that no, it doesn't. And really, when you look at the text, it, it's obvious. <laughs> it's and it, it's painfully obvious that that's not what it's that's that's not what it's talking about. Nowhere in those verses, and I think what get what gets people is that it says that uh, that all and all who believe were together and had all things in common. Um, and so they look at that and they see that used in the same way later in chapter four. 
If you, if you flip over to chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And so they say, okay, so everybody took their belongings and everybody had a, had, had a common possession of the things that people needed, and so they, they, that's, how they, that's how they lived. Well, no, that's not, that's not how it was. That's not what we're dealing with here. Back in chapter 2, verse 45, it's obvious, that it's, it's obvious that that's not the case. Again, note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that they pooled their resources and they shared things. That's not what having all things in common means. Having all, uh, what they did was they, they were selling their possessions and belongings. If this is something about just pooling their resources, you don't have to sell it. You don't have to sell anything. You just throw it in the pool and say, here, that what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. So the fact that they're selling these things automatically obliterates this whole thing of communal living. And then secondly, since they're liquidating their, their possessions and they have the proceeds from these sales, um, they put the proceeds to the apostles' feet, as you see in chapter 4. But again, what we see here is that the proceeds go to any as had need, as any had need, actually, as it says there um, in verse 45. Um, this wasn't something where this is open for everybody and we all share these same things. It's one person saying, hey, I see my brothers and sisters in need. I'm going to provide for those needs. That's, <laughs> that is all that we're talking about here. So really, so what does this whole thing mean about the, even when you look at chapter 4, verse 32, everything having in common, it seems like that's connected to the belongings that people had. Well, notice what this says here. We'll go back again to, to chapter 4, verse 32. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. I think that's the big part of having all things in common, talking about that unity of heart and soul. Um, that's not the full picture, but that's a large portion of it. And no one said that any of the things, listen, that belonged to him was his own. So it's not saying that everybody shared everything. That the, even even though they said these things are not, they didn't consider it as their own. It's still we still acknowledge in that verse that these are th- that the pos- that the possessions that they had were things that belonged to them. If this was a shared uh, thing of shared resources, then it, we wouldn't even have to say that these were things that belonged to them. You see what I'm saying? So um, it, it's kind of a, contradic- a contradictory sort of thing. We're saying this is you kind of had this communal living in this form when it says here that these are things that people belong to them. Now, if that's the case, now what does it mean where it says that uh, the things that belong to them, they didn't consider it as their own? I think that that simply means when they're saying it's not their own, they're saying it's not their own um, in the sense that they recognize that everything that they have belongs to the Lord. God's the one who owns everything. It doesn't, in the truest sense of things, nothing belongs to us. It all belongs to God. I think that that's what they're talking about. So it belonged, it, all of it belongs to the Lord. And in that sense, it's nothing is of their own. And so they held everything in common. How? By being of one heart and soul. And then connected to that, what they do is that since they realize that those things that belong to them really is not their own, but belongs to the Lord, they want to use the Lord's resources for the Lord's glory in, listen, meeting people's needs. Okay, so that's the way that you that you describe this whole thing. It's not a matter of we push pool our resources together and then everybody shares everything as if it's a communistic system. Again, like I said, the fact that they're selling their 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 lands uh, and and possessions automatically dismisses that whole thing outright, um, and um, and the fact that they give the proceeds to to any who had need or to the apostles and lay it at their feet, uh, so that they can distribute the 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 uh, proceeds to people who actually have need. What do they need? Well, they need food. They might need lodging. They might need other things. I mean, if this was just a matter of common sharing, you don't sell your possessions. You just throw it in and say, "Here, have it," or "Here, share it." We can both use it. Now, I'm sure some of some of that happened as well. You, just, you need to use this here. You can use it. But I mean, we we miss the point when we try when people try and use that passage as something that that was an early form of communism or communal living. Um, that's not what you have in mind. Now, here's the thing that I do want us to focus on as it relates to that verse. 
that verse really speaks well to just the sacrifices that people are able to make. And again, this also this also ties into how this uh, this whole thing is into communal living, because this isn't something where everybody is sharing equally with with resources that are pooled in. When somebody sold their possessions, they no longer owned it. So, you know, there is a sacrifice there. They, they sacrifice the things that they have in order to meet the needs of another. That's, that's what you have. And think, of, and think about what you have here in, in chapter 2. It's talking about possessions and belongings, um, which could mean anything. And I'm sure it meant that they, that they sold things that were of value. Um, but um, in chapter 4, again, if you flip over to chapter 4, in verse 34, it says that there were there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was of what was sold. So people were so selling land and selling houses. That shows the uh, magnanimous uh, uh, gesture that was that uh, gestures that were being made from these early Christians to meet one another's needs. And I think that that's absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, and understand lands and houses. We're not talking about garage sales here. Now, I'm not I'm not talking down on, on garage sale fundraisers and things like that. Those things are fine. Don't mis- misunderstand me. But understand me. But understand what I am saying when I make the comparison. When we raise funds in a church or something by having a garage sale, usually what's sold? What's sold are things that we don't want or need anymore. And say, oh, we, I haven't read this in years. I can do away with this, or I don't need this anymore. I haven't used it since 1972 or <laughs> something or something like that. Usually we're getting rid of stuff that we, we don't have any value. We don't have, find any value in anymore, but somebody else might. Um, and we sell them at bargain basement prices, um, which is fine. Again, this is fine. Please understand me. I'm not saying that that's, that's wrong or bad. I'm just saying in comparison, I'm just trying to, to tell you the, the, the lengths that people went to to make sure that people's needs were met. They sold lands and houses, things that in all likelihood held very huge value to them. And they say they sold those lands and they, and they, and they brought the proceeds and they laid it at the apostles' feet so that they could distribute that to people who had need. You, does that does that demonstrate in a very real way love and concern for one another? Yeah, it does, and it's no wonder that that you see later on that 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 they that they gain the favor of all the people, just because just imagine of what kind of things they were seeing in that community, right? So they were meeting needs, and now in verse forty six it says, "And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts." And then verse 47, I'll go in verse 47 since it's the same sentence, praising God and having favor with all the people. Okay, so notice the very first thing that you see there with verse 46, day by day, right? This wasn't, this wasn't just um, they get together once a week and then they say, um, I'll see you next week. They were connected to, to, they made each other part of their lives in a da- on a daily basis. Now that doesn't mean, again, I'm not saying that one thing that we need to do in the church today is have church gatherings and church services every single day. Although if a church decided to do that and people are okay with doing that, that would be awesome. Um, I know that there's, uh, there, there was a woman, a Korean woman that I knew from, from way back. Um, her church was like that, her Korean church. They met every day. Um, but um, but it, it, we, let's not take this into something where he says this means that we have to have church services every day or we have to meet up with a small group every day. But it does speak to something where we are we are constantly connected with one another, and it's not just once a week. We make one another a part of our a part of our lives, and that's where relationship comes in. Now you notice here that this is that this is something that speaks both, I believe, corporately and on a more smaller, intimate level. So if you wanted to look at this in the in, through the lens of 21st century culture, we can look at the corporate worship service and then small groups, perhaps, perhaps. Um, but in verse 46, it says, notice it says that day by day, what were they doing? Attending the temple together and then and breaking bread in their home. So one area, they, they were attending the temple together. And this might have taken a couple of forms. Uh, you know, we, we're going to see in the very next chapter and at the temple, they had, a t- they had times of prayer. 
That's not just a Christian thing. That's a Jewish thing. But apparently the Christians participated in that as well because that's what Peter and John were going to be doing. They were going to be praying. Um, so they might have been going to the temple to pray together as a larger group um, and, and, and doing that. Um, there were t- people who taught at, at, at different areas of the temple. So maybe they, they, they taught one another um, in, those, in those times when they went to the temple. Um, they probably maybe even shared the gospel with other regular Jews of the culture who didn't know Christ. Um, we're going to see Peter do that on a situational basis here in the next chapter, in chapter 3, but you even see that in chapter 5 um, when the apostles are arrested and then the angel lets them go and says, go and go to the temple courts and preach the way of this new life. Um, so, And maybe that was already going on even before that time um, when they were doing this day by day and attending the temple together. Perhaps, um, but whatever they were doing, they were doing it together. That's the that's the thing that we want to underline here. Um, they were doing this together, attending the temple together, and as it says, breaking bread in their homes. So outside of the temple, and now in into into homes, in in individual homes, they were breaking bread. Now again, this breaking of bread in the homes might also have to do m- might be something where communion or the Lord's Supper was being celebrated in in smaller homes, individual homes, um, with smaller groups of people as they as they continue to fellowship with one another um, and celebrating the body and blood of of Jesus Christ as a memorial. Um, that's that's very much as well, but it's it's apparent also that they were that they were sharing a meal together, because not only were they breaking bread in their homes, they were receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, as it, as it was saying, as it says there. So they were, um, uh, so and and in a lot of ways that might be a connection. There might be a connection between um, those two things, um, where. Um, because as as culture would have it, as as time went on, there was a there was a love feast, there was a meal that was connected to um, uh, the taking of the Lord's Supper. Paul even uh, kind of hints at that when you look at places like uh, I believe it's First Corinthians chapter eleven. Um, so you so even in smaller groups, so. That would be even cool in our small groups. Um, I'm not saying that this is something you have to do, and and that if you're not, you're you're not, not living biblically. But I, but I think a lot of times when we think of the Lord's Supper, we think of it on, in the larger context during the large worship service. I think it would be totally okay and legitimate if even in our small groups we decided um, to take communion together. And actually, I think that would, I think that would be awesome. I, I don't know about you, but I think that would be really cool. Um, so, you know, whatever the case may be, I mean, you, you know, you, you had people who shared a meal together and they were receiving their food with glad and generous, some, some translations say sincere hearts um, as well. So um, you, you had a lot of good fellowship going on there. Now, notice verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Okay, so you know it, it got to a, it was a point where with the fellowship with with God and with each other they were they were um, their lives exhibited um, praise and thanksgiving, and I get the sense that this wasn't something that was hidden just within their group. This was something that was very evident in their lives outside of the temple and outside of the the, the gatherings in the homes. Um, you know, it, it's something that. I think in connection to this, uh, where you see having favor with all the people. Um, so uh, this was something that people on the outside looking in were seeing and they were observing. Perhaps they saw some of this um, as people, as they were attending the temple together, because the temple was a public place as opposed to in individual homes. Um, that might have been the case. But again, if we're talking about praising God, if this is something where God is truly at work in the community, this is something that even just spills over outside of those times of community, um, which I think is very noteworthy and it catches people's attention. And so it, the people were having favor with all the people um, in the sense that, that I think that they lived in an attractive way to the people on the outside looking in. But I also think that in some way this, this also speaks to how the early church interacted with people. Um, there was, the, you know, w- the church is going to have its enemies. We're going to see that. Um, so, I mean, we're going to see the other side of the coin here. But one thing that we have to understand that there are two sides to a coin when it comes to relating to our culture today. Um, some people, it's you know, we, the, when, when the Spirit is really at work in our midst as a community, uh, and P- God can use that to draw people in, 
Other times, it's, got, it's not going to look attractive because it's, it serves as a very convicting uh, thing to people who are on the outside looking in. So we have to understand, we have to understand that. Um, but um, it's very noteworthy here that on this side of the coin, what we're seeing with people's reaction to um, to the early church and how that fellowship is going on, that you that uh, that the church was having favor with all the people, um, and I don't and I, and I in no way take that to mean that they were manipulating the message to make it more palatable or anything like that. It was just something that was a natural outgrowth of their of how they lived together and how they received the teaching, how they lived their t- the teaching of the apostles as they were learning to obey everything that Christ commanded them. All these things working together, which, which, would, which would result in them um, um, having, the favor with, uh, having the favor with all the people. Um, and, and one really quick word on this, because one of the things, this is one reason I think, and, and perhaps some people draw from this passage to kind of, to kind of make this uh, connection, but you know, a lot of times we have uh, people who will try and invite other people to church um, which is fine. I mean, that's okay. I mean, they can they can come. But I think one reason among a few um, that people do that is so that they can see the love that people have with one another within the within the time that they get together on Sunday. But usually, I think that the understanding of of the love that's displayed is kind of narrow and and somewhat incomplete. I think, and maybe I'm wrong. I think that sometimes people approach it and, and thinking that. I want my non-Christian friends or family members to be able to see how nicely we treat each other and how we smile and shake each other's hands and how warm we are, um, which that can play a part. But really, like I said, it's it's a lot of times that's narrow and incomplete. I think one of the parts of the reasons why they gain favor with all the people because they because they realize how they took care of one another and and true loving concern, which was active. Uh, you know, see, something can be very passive when we just smile and say nice words to one another. But, you know, when when love is active, when people are selling their possessions and their goods to meet the needs of other people, which would include, as we see in Chapter 4, lands and houses, yeah, that's that's truly going to be a, a display of authentic love that's going to catch people of the world totally by surprise. And they say, wow, this is a different group than who I'm used to interacting with um, at the bar or at work or wherever. So I think that that uh, that, that says, says something really significant about how the early church lived their lives and how they interacted with other people. Um, see, I, I think I don't think that the favor of all the people is really something that happened independent of them interacting with with other people um, on the outside. Which I think it, I think is is another word that we that we need to that we need to say to one another as as far as that goes. Because the danger that we have today is that we we close ourselves in um, into our own spiritual bubbles. And the only interaction that we have are with Christians and in our different groups, whether it's small groups or whether it's corporately or anything. We're not out and we don't really. And we even we might even go all out of our way to stay away from unbelievers, even if they're not engaged in anything that is totally immoral. We're just so used to gravitating towards other believers, which fellowship among believers is is fine and important but really if we're if we're wanting to make disciples of all nations if we're really wanting to spread the gospel we have to be where unbelievers are sometimes we have to interact with them we have to talk with them maybe we can develop friendships with them get to know them um, those things are important as well and I think in an indirect way I think that's that's something that we can draw from this passage okay so they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And finally, the end of that part of that verse in uh, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I can't help but, but really make the connection between the whole thing where it says the Lord was adding to their number day by day. And it was the thing where in verse 46, they're saying day by day, uh, they were attending the temple together. That's another reason why I think that one of the things that they were doing at the temple day by day was was preaching the gospel was preaching the message to unconverted jews um now here's the thing as they were walking in step with what the lord was doing the lord was the one who was bringing the increase notice it says the lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved so we started with three thousand and now 
this this whole thing is is starting to grow. So this is one of the, that at last part there is one of is one of the what I call I think I mentioned this before uh, my own term for this is progress reports, and we're going to see more progress reports as we go through the Book of Acts. Okay, but here's one of them. Um, this is the first one since we since we saw the first initial. Um, burst of conversions at Pentecost, uh, at Pentecost where there were 3,000 souls added uh, um, added to their number, okay? So um, there you see the progress report where day by day, um, not just once every every few months or something or, in, or, or, or anything. Now here again, I want to bring to our attention the thing that I don't want us to do with passages like this and with the book of Acts in general because, you know, 3,000 souls at Pentecost is pretty amazing. And even when you look at, at the end of verse 47, the Lord adding the, adding to their number day by day those who are being saved, that's amazing. Day by day, people are being saved and being added to their number. That's amazing. Now, here's the thing that I don't want us to do, and I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. I don't want us to take patches, passages like this and, and things in the book of Acts and look at it as if we're looking at it a di- at a distance and saying, isn't that great what God did back then, but in our minds thinking God can't do the same thing today. Um, I ask, why not? Why can't God do something like this today? Um, we have to get ourselves in a mode and in an attitude of, of faith and saying that God can do that today. Now, God is in control of things. God is God works in and through us. I, I want to be careful because I don't want to say that this is something that happens with every single encounter um, all the time. It can if God works its, works his way through that. But I think sometimes when or our lack of faith sometimes short circuits things sometimes and um you know we 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 do a lot to sabotage ourselves uh because we we might say well god can't do this or that Um, we might not say that verbally or as explicitly but implicitly and in our own hearts we might have that feeling Um, and i don't want that to, to to be the case um so keep that in your mind so again we see we end this time with another amazing statement about the lord's work and adding to their number and so, uh, and I think what's obvious is that as people were being added to their number, they were being baptized, and they were being uh, taught by the apostles, and they were devoting themselves to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, and things like that. So, really, so I hope you see as as this community is is grounded together, as they're knit together in a common purpose, um, that you see the after effects of that, of just how God is at work in the in the fellowship, and how that works out into. Uh, bringing about more conversions um, and more people and more people to faith. So, um, so really, I, I hope that this gives you um, a good understanding of what good a good solid community um, of believers look like. And I think that this is important. Here's one thing. Uh, here's a word that I can say um, just as we wrap up, um, and something that I hope this speaks to all of our hearts. Because remember, uh, th- this whole thing. You get the sense that when you read this. Every, everybody in that community was other-centered. And you especially get that sense when you talk about people selling their possessions and belongings and giving to any as they had need. And I'm not saying that people don't do that today to some extent or to, or to some degree, but I, do, but I do say that with that certain display of, of otherness or other-centeredness, not looking just on themselves but on the, on the good and the well-being of others, um, you see something that's truly amazing that I think is easy for us to slip away from here in our society today in the 21st century. Because let's be honest, our church culture in America today is very self-centered. Um, I, I think maybe some of you will disagree with me with that, and that's fine, but I think maybe a lot of you might even agree with me on that. All of the things having to do with church and, and community, we make it a lot about us, don't we? Well, this, this group isn't meeting my needs, so I'm going to leave. Um, the church isn't doing this or that. I'm not satisfied with this, so I'm going to leave. I don't like how the church does this, so I'm going to go to another church. I don't like how this person, you know, says this, and so I'm going to. You notice how much we, in our thinking, we use I and we and and me and 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 my. Um, we make things of church a lot about us. Um, do we extend ourselves so that we can meet? the needs of other people so often we try and make it about our needs we we want things to be established in the church to meet my need or my family's needs or our needs and those needs i'm not even saying that those needs are unimportant those needs are important but they're not they're not the thing 
um, have the question that we have to ask right back is that are you actively commu- uh, living in community with other people, serving serving other people, meeting the needs of other people, um, extending yourself to other people? Is that is, is that something that describes you, or are you somebody who's just being a consumer? And saying um, essentially, it's all about me. And if and if these needs aren't met of mine, or if you don't do, if the church doesn't do this for me, or if the church doesn't provide this for me, um, or if the church doesn't consider me in these areas, then I'm just going to go somewhere else. That's very consumeristic, and you don't get that sense from these people. Now, as much as as that might be a problem in a large sense in the church today, I, I do want to acknowledge that there are many pockets of community in our churches today that are very other centered. I remember and I'll just say this as I close, is that years ago, um, when I was when I was working in college ministry, I was I was spending time with a director and um, his father in law, his wife's father had 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 at that time recently died. And um, I, I believe they were he was in Oklahoma, so they had spent some time in Oklahoma just gathering, uh, just taking care of affairs, if, you know, funerals, arrangements, and all, the, and all those things. And after all of that was all said and done, I was riding in the car with him. I don't remember what we were doing or where we were going. Um, but, you know, he said, he said this to me. He said, you know what? Say what you will about the American church today and its flaws. But, man, I got to tell you, the display of love and concern for the church when we went down there in Oklahoma in the midst of our grief and, and just um, just as we tried to take care of things, man, that was truly amazing. So I don't want to I don't want to paint a picture of, of, of us of this saying that you know nobody is is serves one another and, and 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 things like that. All I'm saying though is that we have to be very careful because our culture it's very easy in our culture to, to be to be captured by the consumeristic mindset and it's and it is rife. But even though that is the reality, there are still people Christians and churches in the United States. Who, who extend themselves in very loving ways, Christ living in and through them, extending his love onto other people and serving other people with Christians in need. And for this friend of mine who saw this in Oklahoma, it's truly a refreshing thing to hear stories like that of believers coming together and, and serving their brothers and sisters in time of need. I think that that's truly amazing. So here we see the initial the initial pictures of a fellowship within the within the uh, within the community of believers, um, and so we will end it there. We finish chapter two, and we're going to uh, we're going to start chapter three. But we're not gonna we're not gonna do that next time. Uh, what we're gonna do next time? We're gonna take a week, and maybe just depending on how things unfold, maybe another week. Um, um, to I'm gonna I'm gonna take some I want to take some time to talk about. <laughs> Some thing, ha- things having to do with how we relate to our pastors and how we appreciate our pastors, um, and that's all in um, uh, in honor of, of uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. Pastor Appreciation Month obviously isn't something that's scriptural. I mean, it's something that's cultural, and that's fine. But as long as we're in that season, let's take a cu- a, a week or two um, within uh, the month of October and pre- Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, to really talk about how we can really uh, biblically, because again, this is loving the scriptures, and we look at scripture and see how we can do this, um, how we can honor our pastors. And within that, I, I have a sense that this is, for me anyway, this is going to be somewhat of a heartfelt sort of thing to kind of, um, uh, that I'm going to share with you, because truth of the matter is, um, I think that there are a lot of ways in which we as parishioners fail to appreciate our pastors in the other 11 months of the uh, months of the year. In fact, we may do things that really make the pastor's job harder for him to do. Um, and that's some, and, that, and those are things that we really shouldn't be doing. It's, it's kind of, I, I, the way that I sense this is going to turn out is, is kind of me kind of making a plea to other churchgoers um, in America about about how they relate to their pastors because I got to tell you there are some things that go on with our pastors today where I just uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to lay it out here now. I feel sorry for a lot of our pastors um in our country today. Um 
and that has a lot to do with all the expectations that are thrown upon them and then how we how we react to how he might be meeting or not meeting those expectations and we have to even ask those questions are, are those expectations even biblical to begin with so the I'll just throw that out there just as a, as a little bit of a taste, but that's just one thing uh, as well as other things that we'll, that we'll kind of talk about and explore um, in honor of Pastor Appreciation Month. And then when we're done with that, we'll, we'll, we'll go into, uh, we'll get into chapter three of Acts. So we'll call it quits there. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this time. Listen, if you enjoy this uh, podcast, um, you, you could, I would encourage you to share this, um, with your family and friends. Um, you can subscribe to my, to my show on iTunes, um, leave a review also. That's very beneficial to my show on iTunes as well. If you leave a review, so do that and share, um, uh, and, and share this podcast, whether it's just this particular episode or or maybe the whole podcast all together. Um, anything that you do uh, can really can really help. So, um, like I said, we'll we'll go ahead and end it there and um, and call it quits. Uh, hope you've enjoyed our time together. I know I have. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you next time. Bye now.